Hey, man, well, good morning. I'll do something I never do. Good morning. All right. Uh, it's great to hear the spirit of the church. Well, let's jump on in here. Sorry, I just had a very important call that I was just getting off of. Awesome. Well, today, uh, today we begin uh, my farewell sermon. It's a two-part series, so we'll have a second part in two weeks. Amen. But um, the title of the series is You Are Precious in My Sight. And, and of course, the, that verse is in Isaiah 43. Uh, and, excuse me. But it also conveys my, my heart for all of you here uh, in the D.C. church. You are precious in my sight. Uh, today's lesson, though, is going to be uh, part one. It's entitled The Most Important part of you. The, most, the best part of you. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I endeavor in these last two sermons to end where I began with all of you when I arrived. And uh, when we arrived, I started in Proverbs 19, uh, teaching that it was to a man's glory to be able to overlook an offense. See, to be able to overlook an offense you've got to have kind of a space suit on. Yeah. Or you've got to have some armor on yeah. so that attacks don't harm you and get to your heart. Then we uh, discovered the book called Unoffendable. Yeah. And, we, uh, and we talked about being unoffendable because uh, this church has been through a lot. Yeah. On, then we had a series on the Lord's Prayer yeah. where, we, uh, where we highlighted uh, not just being fully committed to the Lord, but also being able to forgive like the Lord. And, uh, you, you know, for two years, I, I have heard the outcry of our membership. There is an outcry of the membership here. And um, I have heard your outcry to be able to have safe, meaningful relationships that bring value to your life, that, that help you be stronger spiritually. And as I close out in these last two sermons, I endeavor to bring us the full measure uh, so that teaching sticks. Amen. You know, we are part of a church that actively engages in the spiritual battle. You know, each change and transition in the church is kind of like going on a tour of duty to Afghanistan. Soldiers come back from those tours of duty with PTSD. Very few of them escape that. And so to actively be at war with Satan day in and day out and understand you're a part of that war, we can get PTSD. And so today I endeavor to have a little bit of what I'd call some spiritual cognitive behavioral therapy. And so I end with two sermons, the best part of you, and two weeks from now will be all of you. See, because of the best part of you, God demands all of you. He doesn't want part of you. He doesn't want a little bit of you. He wants the whole thing, the whole enchilada. And yet the world wants to enslave you. The world wants you codependent on people, things, and, and yet with no regard for the impact on your life. This could even creep into the church. This is where PTSD comes from, right? It can creep into discipling. It can creep into mentoring. It can creep into serving one another and glorying in a role. God forbid you ever get to the place where a role is more important than your soul. It can even creep into giving to the Lord. Somehow we think when we talk about giving that Jesus said give up everything but except money. He meant all of you. He meant all of you. There is a time to give everything. And for me, I recognize I'm here because somebody gave up everything. I was able to speak to people in the former movement where I was baptized that 
who sold their wedding rings, who sold their homes. I actually met people who did exactly what the Bible said is they sold their home and put all the money in the plate. And I'm a product of that. I'm here because of that. I don't, I don't wince and I don't pull back at, at saying there's, there's nothing wrong with that. There is something wrong with hurting yourself doing that. There is something wrong with doing it without faith and hurting you and putting blood money in the plate. If there's no faith, do not give. But today is the day that we finish our special. And amen. And so today we have to give $105,000 to reach our goal today. And that's about 1,500 for about 60 people. You know what I mean? So, so it's, it's a doable thing if we want to do it. There's no, there's no thing that we can't finish the goal today within our church. And, uh, and, and I pray that we will. And if you don't, okay, you don't. Nobody's coming after you. Nobody's coming to your home. Nobody's, nobody's doing all, all this nonsense that you see. And, and yet, we do have the quandary that Satan convinces good-hearted disciples to forget that they're supposed to be like a, little, like a mother, loving her little children in our interactions with each other, rather than behaving like officers, policing the behavior of adults. And, you know, saying those words should not shock you. Read your Bible. Mankind was birthed, created, and the first thing, the first thing that happened is a disobedience to God. And with the disobedience, what was the response? This woman you put here with me, gaslighting. Right out of the gate, Adam's gaslighting his wife. And then, and then the wife's like, serpent, serpent. And it, and it fed to the kids. I mean, Abel gave his best. People who don't give their best always attack people who don't give their best. This started right from the beginning. And it never stopped. It never stopped the entire time. When, when in your Bible do you see there's nothing happening like that? It should not shock you. It's why you should have your armor on all the time. Amen? There's a reason God chose you. But, you, but being chosen, you have to know who you are and where you are. Um, because this is not a room of former sinners, right? <laughs> you hear people tell their testimony sometimes and they're like, like they never sin anymore. <laughs> so so uh, I'm like, wow, I wanna be like you. <laughs> this is not a room of former sinners, this is a room of active sinners, right? The only difference is this is a room of active sinners who are actively fighting their sinful nature every day, man. But everybody has a bad day. Let's not gloss over a whole family of churches because of a bad day. No, we have 365 bad days doing the same garbage and we have something to talk about. You know what I'm saying? But we are going to fight this fight on God's strength and win. Or we're going to fight this fight on our own strength and lose. And you'll either hurt your faith or lose it if you fight it on your own strength. And on your own strength means your armor's not on. Let's be clear about that. And all this doesn't have to scare you. There's so much focus put through every avenue of communication in our world that you shouldn't be mistreated. And that you should pull away when you're mistreated. That you should get rid of toxic things in your life. And yet, all these things that are allowed by God. God allows bad things to happen. If he didn't, he'd have to take away your free will. And he'd have to take away your sinful nature. And, and then what would life be like? We think it would be great. It'd be absolutely boring. There would be no need for mentoring. There would be no need for... It. Basically, the need for interaction would stop. And, 
God allows things to empower you, to give you life, to give you peace. You know, there's no peace in what's happening. When you learn not to be affected by it, there will be peace that endures. And he wants to give you a harvest of righteousness. He doesn't want you to just be a little righteous. He doesn't want you to just squeak past when you get into heaven with fire flaming off the back of you. He wants you to have a harvest of righteousness. But you must endure unrighteousness and learn obedience from it to be blessed with the harvest of righteousness. Today's the day to stop running. But today's the day to learn how to stop running because you don't have to run. Because you can stand in the face of whatever God allows to happen. Turn to Isaiah 43. I recently watched a movie. I'm going to spoil it all for you. I'm actually, I usually have a little spoiler. This one spoils the whole movie. So if you haven't watched it by now, and you know, I'm, it's a movie entitled The Adam Project. Raise your hand if you've seen it. Awesome movie. You'll go watch it after this. It's a movie about a family where the father invents time travel. And then he dies very shortly after inventing time travel, right? And, and so his investor t steals his invention and then uses the time travel to take over the world. And then the son, who's 40 years old, is fighting against the investor. Him and his wife are fighting the investor to undo what she did. And, and so... He goes back in time and he's meaning to go to where his, his wife jumped to and is in the middle of being shot at as he gets the coordinates in the jump and he misses the jump. And he ends up six months after his, da his dad died. And, and so he goes to the house and there's his younger self. And so the movie begins to thrive that with the older self and the younger self now partnering up to go try and fix this thing that was created in time. And so, uh, and, and so, now the thing about this is that the younger son just had his father die. His emotions are raw, he misses his dad. He's flooded with all these memories of joy at his times with his dad. And the older version of himself has daddy issues. <laughs> and his bitterness made him rewrite all that really did happen with him and his dad were in his mind, we had, him and his dad had a terrible relationship. His dad had no time for him. And so, and so they go ahead and jump to the proper place in time before time travel was invented. And, and they do it together and they're just going at each other, the younger version and the older version. It starts out the younger version is this young little skinny guy and, and he gets beat up at school every single day. And then, and then when he finds out this, this guy that came out of the sky from this, this time machine, it's Ryan Reynolds, so he's like, <laughs> you know. And, and he's like, oh my gosh, I am awesome. Oh, this is great. And, and, and yet as they start interacting with each other, they start seeing each other's weaknesses. The older version is disgusted by him. I cannot believe I was ever like you. <laughs> And, and then, and the, and the older, the younger one, you know, sees that the older one has daddy issues and can't understand why he has daddy issues. Doesn't understand what happened to him that make him so bitter. And, and of course, you know, uh, the younger one disciples the older one. They're sitting down and they're eating together. And this is, and he says, things happen to you. Well, but he, things happen to me. To us, he says. And we suck at dealing with it. And I'm starting to think that's something we do. He says, I think it's easier to be angry than to be sad. And I guess 30 years from now, I forget that there's a difference. And of course, you know, they save the day. They go back and get dad and dad fixes everything. And then there's this beautiful scene at the end where where, you know, the older one had forgotten that every day, no matter when dad got home, he would go out and play catch with him, no matter what time it was. And so all three of them are out playing catch. 
And of course, they, they disappear and go back to their timelines and all of that. But right before he goes, the older version looks at the younger version of himself. He says, man, I spent 30 years trying to get away from the me that is you. But you were the best part the whole time. And I can't even say it without crying. See, the older Adam realized he had forgotten the difference between being angry and sad. See, we start out sad, we lose our childlike heart, and we get mad, and then we start getting mad so much more quickly each time, it just seems like we go straight to anger. And we forget the difference between being sad and being mad. And while you and I acted like a child, it's supposed to act. You remember that? When you used to act like a kid, the way a kid's supposed to act? People, used, people use this particular word with children while they're still childlike. They called you precious. Called you precious. That's how your parents described you. That's how other adults that saw you described you. Do you remember the last time someone said to you that you are precious? Because you are. That's why you're here. That's why you're in church. It's why you want to follow God. Do you remember when you lost that? Here comes the cognitive behavioral therapy part. <laughs> See, when you lost it, you go, I don't remember. Well, I can help you. You lost it. And you have memories. They're your first memories that are kind of confused or negative. It's in those moments that you started to lose your childlike heart. Turn to Isaiah 43, verse 1. See, you are so special and precious that Jesus is not the only son that God gave up for you. We focus on the cross and we should absolutely it is the center of our salvation it is the center of our love it is the center of our life that Jesus was the perfect one out of a long list of people that God has given up for you and me. Isaiah 43 verse one, Isaiah says, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. Look around this room. Anybody in here redeem you? Anybody in here redeem you, save you, die for you, spill their blood, raise from the dead for you? Okay. Some of us view others like that is the case. And run to people like that is the case. Nobody in this room is your savior. He says, I have redeemed you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine, he says. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. See, when you go through your hard stuff, you know why you call other people? Because they're not with you when it happens. But you know who is right there with you? Your God, your Savior, your Lord, Jesus Christ. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Oh, yeah, they do, because you're not walking with God. The waters can only sweep over you when you're not walking with God the way he calls you to. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now check out who he gives up for you. I give Egypt for your ransom. God gave a whole country for you and me. Cush and Seba in your stead. He says, since you are precious, even the nasty, bitter, resentful adult you, who you were is still precious to God. And he gives you the power to get it back. Since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you. I don't like that any more than you do. But it already happened. 
And it deserves to be honored. And people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. Here's a fact. I belong to the Lord. Not because I'm a minister, because I'm a disciple of Jesus. I belong to the Lord. Guess what? Before I was baptized and didn't know him, I was his. I belong to the Lord. In fact, every person that's lost around the world is a child of God and belongs to the Lord, whether they know it or not. I am his and you are his. You know, it's funny. It seems like we shouldn't even need to preach this. It seems like it, just should, it should just be obvious. But we get so caught up with people we can live in such a way that we give people so much of our time that we end up only giving scraps to God. <laughs> giving up all this time for somebody who didn't redeem me, didn't save me, isn't there for me when the th bad things happen. So it needs to be taught. See, I want you to wrap your mind around this statement. <laughs> You and I need to get mature by growing back into our childhood. Amen. See, we don't need to go there and act childish. We need to grow there in our heart, in our mind, in our feelings, in how we respond to people and how we respond to life. We need to be mature enough to act and react like little children. See, when children are hurt, they cry. When they're hurt, they cry. It's interesting. I don't see very many kids cry out of joy. <laughs> they would never have tears because they're always full of joy. But when they're hurt, they cry. They say, that hurts. When they're told to forgive by their father, they forgive without question. Instantly. Why? Because dad said so. Because mom said so. I don't, they don't need to re know the reason why. They don't need to know if they're going to actually do it again or not. Mom or dad said do it, so I'm good. Let's, let's go. All right, let's go play. So that's what they're like before they lose their childhood heart. When they begin losing their childlike heart, they get hurt and hold it in. And then, and then it just builds and builds and builds into anger. You know what I'm saying? You ever been there? And then the next time, a little faster, get to the anger until it's almost indistinguishable. But see, there's a reason you are precious in God's sight. You're precious in God's sight because of the best part of you, your inner child. He didn't save you for your adult self. He saved you for your childlike self. Because that's what's needed to save the world. Right. Why do you think he let all the adults die in, in Israel? All the 20 year olds and up died in Israel. And, and Caleb and Joshua took, I mean, they're, they're, we always say 2 million, but we gotta understand the culture, right? Every family had like eight, 10 kids, 15 kids, right? <laughs> so all the adults die and what's left is the kids. So how many kids are there really? 8 million, 10 million wow. with, with two chaperones. Two guys, too, at that. There's only two male adults and a whole bunch of 19 year and older and younger. 19 and younger. The whole fate of the world resting on them. Why? Because they have the childlike heart. The childlike heart will always save the world. You go, well, I lost that a long, long time ago. That childlike heart, that's naive. That's exactly why you do not understand how precious you are to God. It's exactly why you don't feel precious and special. And you long for people to make you feel that way. See, we, we focus so much on people looking at us as precious. We totally forget we're already precious to God, even if everybody in the world hates us. We want so much time wanting to be chosen 
by people when you're already chosen by God. And, and, and I want to take us through this little journey here today, and it's a little longer lesson. I get to do that when there's only two left. <laughs> but children know that they are special until they lose their childlike heart. Ask any one of them. You're special. I know. <laughs> Can you sing? Yes. Can you dance? Yes. <laughs> no, only one time you missed it. You missed that picture, so. <laughs> but we have to journey back to your inner self. We must. It's essential. It's mandatory. See, there was a point in time in your life that you had that inner child. It was who you were inside and out. And then in one moment in time, nanosecond doesn't even really cut it to describe it. There's one point in time that you're that inner child, right? And then something happens and it's gone. And it just erodes more and more. And guess what? It will never come back until you go back. You got to go back. See, that's what the, the beauty of the movie is. Adam had to go back in time and see his younger self. He had to face his younger self. He had to be discipled by his younger self. And, and man, that kid was getting him the whole movie. It was getting him the whole movie. But he did, he did not want to let go of his bitterness. He did not want to go, let go of the false narrative he created because of his bitterness. And you got to go back to that next point in time and go back that one nanosecond and you're back to your pure child self. That's what God can do for you today. <laughs> Don't you want to feel like that again? Yeah. Come on, People want to help, but they can't. Your best friend can't give this to you. Your mentor can't give it to you. Your discipler, your, the church can't give it to you. I can't give it to you. Only God can grant you a childlike heart. And if you're going to get it, you got to go back and fight for it with all you have. Because everything in your life depends on understanding that child you used to be. See, we need to learn today how to make adult decisions with a childlike heart. Do not get it twisted. Do not misunderstand the gravity of you finding your inner child. If you miss that mark, the consequences are eternal. Oh, but if you hit it, you get the closest thing to heaven on earth while you stay in that place. Let's look at what Jesus had to say about this. Let's look at what he had to say about the best part of you. Matthew 18, verse 1. Our first point is your inner child. Your inner child. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Of course, they were, you know they were expecting him to say one of their names. <laughs> they were always talking about who's the greatest. He called a little child, and they're like, dang it, it's not one of us. <laughs> he called a little child and had him stand among them. See, a, ch a child can impact you at just standing there. You know what a child represents. He said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you change, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom. Tell me it's not important to find your inner child. But I was baptized. Read Hebrews 6. Read the whole book of Hebrews. Don't, get, don't let the world fake you out. You can throw it back in God's face, your salvation. No one can take it from you. No one can get in the middle of you. We let him though, right? We get hurt and then we don't want to pray for some reason. He says, therefore, whoever humbles himself. I know you love that word. Mike loves humility. He actually does. That's why he's a church leader now. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom. So you know what God wants to do? Just fire God up. He wants to be up there as everybody's coming in. 
and go, hey, you're the greatest. Yep, yep, you're the greatest. I'm very fond of you, you're the greatest. <laughs> Through all eight billion people is what God, it would make, it would make God, nothing could make God happier than to view you as the greatest in his kingdom. But you gotta love humility for that to happen. It's interesting, there was only one question, but God gave two answers and two lessons. Who's the greatest? Well, you better change and become like this little one or you're never going to find out. <laughs> never going to find out. You better choose humility because I want to call you the greatest. See, when it's all about God, it becomes so crystal clear of where our energy and our focus and our time and our, our life needs to be spent. You and I do have limited hours in our life. You have, a, you have an unlimited eternity, but you only have limited hours to make it to that eternity in the right place. You know, at baptism, I found my inner child. I, I remember, it was awesome. I was happy. I was not reactive to people's nonsense. I was not scared of anything. I was not angry about anything. That's because I confronted my sins and repented. And I knew when I went under the water, the blood of Jesus washed away all my sins. And they were all gone. So, oh, that means I let it be all gone for everybody. This is awesome. Many times in my 30 years have I lost that heart. A number of times since I've been here in D.C., I've lost that heart. But I'm here to tell you, I got that heart back. And I'm fired up. But it takes going through hell on earth to escape hell for eternity. Take a moment with me and think about what it's going to look like for you. To take back your thinking, your feelings... All the way back to that moment that you got hurt. And how beautiful it'd be to go one nanosecond back. That's what God wants you to decide to do today. Because he's already given you the power to do it. You remember not having a care in the world? No worry in your life? Do you remember that? Woo! You remember overlooking offenses very easily? Before you ever knew the scripture said that? <laughs> See, the children innately follow all the passages without ever knowing them. Do you remember running to your father and mother when you were scared or hurt? See, take it spiritually. Why don't you run to your father when you're scared or hurt? Why do you run to people? First, or most. Do you remember when you were scared of the dark? Then why do you hold so much sin in your heart and not talk about it? We're supposed to be scared of the dark. You go, so how do I do that? The same way Adam did in the Adam Project. He went back to that point in time that he was hurting most. And he confronted himself and walked past one no nanosecond in time. Point number two, accepting the kingdom as a child. Job chapter two, verse seven. You gotta talk about Job to become childlike. Job 2 verse 7 says, so Satan went from the presence of the Lord. You know, when he goes from the presence of the Lord, you know who he comes to? He comes to you and me. Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your tragedy? Curse God and die. That's a bitter woman right there. 
He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not the trouble? You got to really ask yourself this question this morning. Are you all about accepting the good from God, but not the bad? What kind of relationship is that if you'll only accept good from someone? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Why? He had not yet lost his childlike heart. But read the book and you find out he did. And here's the thing, if you continue being your adult self, then one day God's going to confront you and tell you, brace yourself like a man. Let me speak to you now. Let me tell you what, there's a difference between having a childlike heart and being childish. See, Job's wife was being childish. And uh, Job was in the middle of still having his childlike heart. But then, you know, all of his friends wanted him to listen to them. And when he wouldn't listen to them, they were abusive to him. Because they were more concerned about him listening to them than him hearing God. And if you follow the path of Job, you will again go back to being childish. You know, I, uh, I counseled the whole church to read 2020 book three. Part one of the book, I, and I always know, and, I, and I've known ever since I read the book, I, I know where people are at in the book or if they haven't read it. Because everybody wants to talk about it once they've read it. But part one is all about becoming immature and childish, not childlike. Now, in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13, chapter 13, 8 through 13, Paul said he put childish ways behind him and became a man. It's an interesting thing because we have the concept in our mind about becoming a man. And we think becoming a man is to not be immature, to not be childish. All that meant is Paul began to make adult decisions with the childlike heart. That's how he became a man. Yes. See, everything's backwards in the kingdom, right? Yeah. See, and, and he ends that, that whole section right there in verse 13, basically saying he eliminated everything in him except faith, hope, and love. That's how you become a child again. See, when a person has lost their inner self, they become immature spiritually. Everything's serious. Everything's serious without gentleness. Nothing's fun anymore. People who have become immature are hard to teach because their, their bitterness makes them defensive and, and resentful and, and not like, and, and, and people that are resentful don't like correction. That's to be immature spiritually. And you know, the fact about the religious world, <laughs> is that most people that go to church spend more time attending one Sunday service in a week than they spend time listening to God by reading their Bible and combined with how much they pray and talk to God. Most religious people only talk to people and only hear about God at service. And so many do know their Bible, but do not know God at all because their life does not reflect the love of a little mother with her children. Who do you talk to more than God? Because that is your God. Who do you rely upon more than you rely upon the Lord and his word? They're your Bible. How emotionally close are you truly to God right now? Because if he came right now, you want to go. You want to be with him. But why are you not prepared today to meet him? Is the Bible a rule book that you must force yourself to obey? Or is it a manual to the best life that you want more than anything else in the world? And are striving to grow into? See, it's to a man's shame. It's to a woman's shame that they would only speak to their God when they're hurt or when there's hardship. 
We know this. Because if I ask you, what kind of marriage do two people have if the only time they talk to each other is when they're upset or hurting? So what kind of relationship with God do you have today? What, how does God define your relationship with him and your reliance upon him? There's only one thing in this world you should be codependent on, and that is the Lord himself. People are both a bonus and a test. When you conduct yourself properly with them, they're a bonus. When they rile you up, they're your test of how close to God you really are. Being in this room doesn't save you. Coming here every week, showing up 30 minutes late, doesn't save you. Sorry, I said it in the first service, I go out with the last one too. Because <laughs> I love you. And you feel my heart. And you know I have no agenda other than I love you and want you to do well. We can become so wrapped up in church that we no longer know God or his heart. Let me tell you what, there is nothing on earth like the kingdom of God. There will be nothing like the kingdom of heaven that is coming for us. But let's not get so wrapped up in church here that we forget about how to get there. Here's an acid test for you that you can always bring yourself back to. Adults who are hurting always pull away from everyone except someone who will allow them to complain and validate their feelings. Children just want to talk to their parents. There's your acid test. There's your acid test of codependence. Luke 6, 27. Luke 6, 27. I'm going to start winding it down here. In Luke 6, 27, he says, but I tell you, who hear me. I hope you hear him today. Love your enemies. What? <laughs> Do good to those who hate you. What? Bless those who curse you. Huh? I thought church is supposed to be fun. Pray for those who mistreat you. Oh, I do that. No, that's not what he's talking about. <laughs> that's not what he's talking about. <laughs> if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other also. And he's going, uh-uh. <laughs> if someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. What in the world? <laughs> Give to everyone who asks you. Well, that's at every storefront now, isn't it? Sad. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. And then he just gets raw on us. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. I think we got it twisted on how we're supposed to react. I think we've let the world tell us how to respond to hardship. I think we've let the world take our childlike heart right from us. It's time you and I grow into being able to put this passage into practice. Think about the fruit of God's spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Doesn't that describe a child? And the Bible says there is nothing that can stand against the spirit of God. That makes finding your inner child the most powerful thing you can do in your life. Children are full of wonder as we should be with God. Children are scared of the dark, just as we should be confessing our sin before somebody asks us about it. Children are resilient, which means they don't complain or overreact to things. They have endless energy. 
just as we should never be lacking in zeal. They love the place, Simon says, because they're humble enough to imitate. And they speak the truth from the heart, not from the hurt. Find your inner child today and humble yourself so you can once again accept the kingdom like a little child. Third and last, third point today, always find yourself. Oh, because you're going to get that childlike heart back and then you're going to lose it again at some point. And you got to go back in time as often as you need to because this is the most important thing you can do for yourself. Philippians 4 verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. You can do that if you got a childlike heart. I'll say it again. Rejoice. And you're like, amen. Say it again. <laughs> Let, uh oh, here it comes. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. That one's going to take a little time. <laughs> But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. That's actually how you get out of the anxiousness. Right? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. See, a child doesn't have to understand why they, do what, why they need to do what they do. They just, got, uh, you know, father or mother says do it and they do it. They don't need understanding. Until they lose their childlike heart will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. But the, but the journey's dangerous because you've got to go back right through the danger. But it's just a one nanosecond jump to get to where you want to be. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. See, this passage describes what the mind of a child looks like. Rejoicing, peace. Just something that happens that's beyond understanding. Everybody else in the room is upset and the kids are like, yeah. it's like when Chez greets you. Do you realize how much trauma you have had to go through to lose yourself? To lose the best part of you? To lose the very reason why God called you? And to stop thinking like you thought as a child. I remember the first time I got separated from my mother. It was at Sears Robux department store in Seattle, Washington. I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. I felt completely lost, completely helpless. You know, that's exactly how you feel when you're not close to God. It's exactly how you feel when you give people your best time and God the scraps. See, you've got to fight through that hurt because once you get there and you make decisions, a decision is the same thing as a moment in time. When you get there, don't think about all the things you already did that didn't work because you didn't have a childlike heart doing it. Think about that one decision and go back in time. You only need one nanosecond of time to find yourself again. Today's the day to break the codependence of legalistic people who have lost their inner self, who treat the best parts of you with contempt, harshness, and call it speaking the truth. It happens in every church, in every century, in every time. It's not new. Stop being shocked by it. They're trying to fill a hole where they lost their preciousness as well. Have pity. 
Know that, you think of this. When you think of a POW that goes out to war and they're sitting there in their cage with somebody holding a gun to them telling you, it's not gonna go well for you if you don't do this. That's what has to happen to a follower of God to sin or to hurt you. They're a POW, they're a prisoner of war, man. Satan's way smarter than all of us. He gets us to point guns at each other all the time. It's stupid. It's stupid, but we all are stupid when we do it. And don't tell me not that there's somebody in this room who hasn't done it. We've all done it. God will deal with that stuff when he feels like dealing with it. He'll deal with it when you feel like getting your childlike heart back is when he'll deal with it. See, you want him to change them first. Change you and find out what God does. Remember, God chose you. He already chose you for the best part of you, that inner child. And Proverbs 4, 24, 4, 23 says, above all else, say it with me, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Find your inner child and he will put people in your life that will value the most important part of you just as God does. So keep running to him until you find the best part of you again, which is exactly why you are precious and why he chose you. I love you guys. I'll see you in two weeks.